please open your Bibles to the 24th chapter of Luke. The 24th chapter of Luke. We will begin our studies where we left off last in Luke, but we will be doing something a little unusual this morning. (coughs) Excuse me. But we will begin by reading Luke 24, starting in verse 13. The uh, text is written on the back of the insert. That very day, two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures all the things concerning himself. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, um, you have testified to yourself and to your work amply in your word. Again and again, our Lord um, referenced your word as the ground, the proof, the warrant for his claims of identity in his work. And now as we study your word, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, Help us to see the glory of the Lord. Help us to see Christ in the Old Testament. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're doing this morning, and if you look at the insert, you'll notice it is a little different from usual, is um, we are going to attempt, I'm going to attempt, a study similar to what Jesus did with these disciples on the road to Emmaus. I thought it was fitting on this Sunday before Christmas to prepare for this next passage in Luke. By looking at some of those texts, we do not know which passages Jesus looked at. We know he began in the Pentateuch or the books of Moses. That's where I will begin And he insisted that rightly understanding the Old Testament should have prepared faithful Israelites for his coming, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And that is what I hope this morning to accomplish. Um, You're welcome to follow along. You're also welcome to just listen as I read the passages and follow along at your leisure. I have, of course, had the cherry pick. There are so many passages that predict our Lord. Um, not only have I cherry picked for this message, I have an additional handout for the ABF. We'll look at some of the others. And even that is but a small sampling of the text. But I want to begin in Genesis. We're to take our particular attention to the books of Moses because God's revelation comes sequentially. So God gives some information. And then a little later, he gives some more information. And then he gives some more information. And in particular, the books of Moses with the Pentateuch, we can see that progression. Once we get to the Psalms and the prophets, it's not as easy to figure out the ordering. But in particular, with the Pentateuch, we're going to focus on God's promise, the coming Messiah. So turn to Genesis chapter 3, where the very first Messianic promise begins. The context is, of course, that Adam and Eve have rebelled against God. They've eaten the fruit that God forbade them to eat. And the, the ordering of creation is entirely put on its head, where as it was supposed to be the Lord God giving commands to Adam, 
who's head over his wife. Together, the two of them would rule the created order, rule the garden. We have the created order, the snake giving instructions to the woman, and the husband falls in line, and they rebel against God. It is entirely backwards. And yet in this context that warrants judgment, and there is judgment, we get the first promise of the gospel. It's not given to Adam or to Eve, even though it's spoken in their hearing, but it's given to the serpent. As the Lord declares to the serpent that what he has done will be thwarted and undone. Look at verse 14 in chapter 3. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And there in that one verse, verse 15, we get the promise that some descendant, the seed of the woman, that's your blank, the seed of the woman, what the ESV translates, the offspring, would one day crush the head of the serpent while being bruised by the serpent. And so what we get are two humanities. These are the categories Jesus speaks in in John chapter 8 when he speaks to the Pharisees. You of your father, the devil. There's the seed of the serpent. There's the seed of God. And so in one sense, it speaks of peoples. But as the New Testament makes clear, in particular, the book of Galatians, ultimately this seed of the woman is one who will particularly be bruised and who will in particular crush the serpent's head. And so here in seed form, pardon the pun. Okay. The gospel, um, the gospel is proclaimed. There will be a defeating of the snake and it will come through the seed of the woman. And so that's what Genesis 3.15 offers. There's a promise even in this judgment. This is how good our God is. He's good. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be consequences. The man and the woman will be kicked out of the garden. Pain will be brought into childbirth. Pain will be in labor will be brought into work. Conflict will enter the marriage. And yet even as the Lord announces judgment, he promises grace and the ultimate defeat of the serpent and his seed. Turn a few chapters now to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And what we're going to look at is immediately after the flood subsides, Noah, a righteous man, um, starts out well. He makes an altar to God. He gives a sacrifice. But then he plants a vineyard, becomes a man of the soil. And he gets drunk. And he, in his tent, is lying naked, oblivious, and One of his sons walks in and and gawks and scoffs and laughs. And he calls his brothers, you know, in verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. And he told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of the father. We see stark contrast between two sons who honor their father, honor his shame and nakedness. They don't want to gaze upon it. And Ham laughing, ridiculing his father. Verse 24, when Noah woke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done. He said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Now this is literally fulfilled in in the conquest of Canaan by Joshua. David enslaves the Canaanites. Solomon enslaves the Canaanites. Not only is there a curse, Noah speaking with the spirit ushers a blessing. Blessed be the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, some people struggle here. Why, why is God cursing Canaan, the son of Ham, when it's Ham who did this deed? I, I think the most likely reason is just as Noah has experienced being shamed by his own son, so, so Ham will experience the shame of a son. And so Canaan is cursed, but I want to focus on the blessing. The blessing, your next blank here, because what we're going to see in, in, in the Pentateuch is a narrowing down. This general promise, the seed of the woman. Well, in one sense, every human being on the planet Earth tracks back to descent from Eve. We're all seed of the woman in one sense. 
But now we're going to narrow it down to a particular people group. The God of Shem. The God of Shem. Now you may not think who are the Shemites, but as the Greek speaking language took that term, the H dropped out. And I'm sure you're well aware of who the Semites are. The Semitic peoples, descendants of Shem. There's a narrowing down. The God of Shem. And the God of Shem will be a blessing to other peoples. Japheth is going to dwell in the tents of Shem, receive a blessing. This is, again, similar to what we're going to see just two chapters later. So it gets narrowed down. We get to the flood, Canaan's cursed. The Semitic people, the descendants of Shem, God is their God. And that blessing will overflow to other peoples. So the first mention of the promise, Genesis 3. The second, narrowing it down to Shem. Now, specifically, turn to Genesis 12. This promise gets picked up in God's call and covenant with Abraham. And again, in in, in salvation history, it's God who takes initiative. It's God who initiates this process of salvation. The Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country and your father's house and kindred to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went, so Abram, sorry, so easy to fill in Abraham. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land, the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So we built there an altar to the Lord. And that word for offspring is seed. To your seed, I'm going to give this land. And coming on the heels of the promise, the woman, your seed, we're getting a further refinement. God's making promises of blessing to Abraham and to his seed. So first from the woman's seed will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. Narrow down to the Semitic peoples, the children of Shem. Now to Abraham, the seed of Abraham. And this becomes more and more clear as Abraham or Abram initially, looks to find a, a child, a descendant, an heir. First through a close relative, then through his wife's idea of going into his um, handmaiden. And God says, no, no, I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a special seed, a child of promise. And of course, that's how Isaac is born. And then the rest of Genesis tracks this promise. Again, this narrowing taking first from Isaac to Jacob Jacob's not the firstborn, he's the secondborn, but he's the son of promise. Now jump all the way to the end of Genesis to chapter 49. And if you read through Genesis, you might be surprised at this. You, who's the central character for the last 20 chapters or so of Genesis? Who, who, does, who gets most of the text attention? It's the story of who? Joseph, right? Joseph. Faithful, Joseph betrayed, Joseph sold into slavery, Joseph who rises to prominence in Egypt. Joseph, through his interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, leads to the salvation and the, the, the protection of millions of people in the area from starvation. And yet Genesis 49, Jacob makes another appearance. And in his final days, he prophesies and blesses his sons. He calls them one by one, and he blesses them. And the promise does not descend to Joseph. We'll pick it up in verse 9. But to the tribe of Judah. Judah is a lion's cub. There's that first reference to the lion of the tribe of Judah. From the prey, my son, you have grown up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as a lioness who dares rouse him. And then we get this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Judah is the one through whom a ruler will come, a ruling scepter. And Judah is singled out as the tribe. This is one of the reasons why when when Saul is chosen as king, the people should have realized something's wrong because Saul, of course, is from the tribe of Benjamin. Wait a second. The the staff 
of rule comes from Judah. And of course, David is a Judahite. So we've got first the seed of the woman, some descendant of the woman, narrowed down to the Semitic peoples, narrowed down to Abraham, narrowed down even further to the tribe of Judah. We're getting closer and narrower and narrower. More precision is given. Um, And we're going to skip over Balaam's oracle. We'll take a look at that in ABF. Turn out of Deuteronomy 18. So we've got first introduced a concept of a ruler, a power, one to whom tribute is due, one who has a ruling staff. Deuteronomy 18 brings in another facet of the Messiah. Deuteronomy 18, we've looked at this before as we've gone through Luke. Verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see the great fire anymore, lest I die. The Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I'll put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Now, Moses is the first significant, consistent miracle worker in the Bible. Um, If you think of his his leading of Israel, notable miracles, the parting of the Red Sea, manna, the striking of the rock, among other things. And God's going to raise, at some future time, a prophet like Moses. And, of course, this gets fulfilled when Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he meets with Moses and Elijah. And the Father says, this is my beloved son, Listen to him. So we're looking for a coming king who will crush the serpent. Now we're looking for a coming prophet. We know the tribe is Judah. And the book of Deuteronomy ends turning again of emphasis to chapter 18. Listen to one of the final verses of Deuteronomy. 34.10. There has not arisen since in Israel a prophet like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. So the book of Deuteronomy ends reminding them we're still looking for this prophet, this one to come. So so that's what the law, I think, reveals from the key passages in the law. There's going to come a descendant of the woman. He will crush the serpent. He will defeat the enemy, the adversary. He will come from the Semitic peoples through the line of Abraham Through the tribe of Judah, he's a ruler who is coming. A prophet is coming. And then we get to the Psalms. And and the Jewish people are already at this point somewhat confused. We get some insight into this in John chapter 1. If you remember in John 1, uh, John the Baptist, or as I like to call him, Dunking John, is doing his thing in the wilderness. And the Jews from Jerusalem send a delegation to him to question what he's doing and by what authority he's baptizing. And this is the testimony of John, John 1, 19 to 23, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now pause. Christ is Greek, Christos, for the Hebrew, Messiah, which we get Messiah from, which means in English, anointed. So Christ, Greek, Messiah, Hebrew, anointed English are the exact, they're interchangeable. You're just changing languages. When you speak of the anointed, when you speak of the Messiah, when you speak of the Christ, you're just speaking of the same thing in English, Hebrew, and Greek. So they said to him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? No, then. No, I'm not the Christ. They said to him, what then? Are you Elijah? Because Malachi promises that Elijah will come again to prepare the way for the Lord. He said, I am not. They said, are you the prophet? Which means they did not understand that the Messiah and the prophet were one and the same person. So that's one of the issues that the Jews of Jesus' day were stumbling over. um, Which is why if you'll turn to Psalm 2, Psalm 2 is so incredibly helpful. Um, Psalm 2 is built upon and the development of God's covenant with David. And, And while you turn there, I'll read for you. 
from 2 Samuel 7, God's covenant with David. You'll, you'll notice the language getting picked up in Psalm 2. So God comes to David. David wants to build a house for God. God says, that's nice, but I'll build a house for you. That same play on words in English works in Hebrew, a house being a building or a house being a dynasty. And the Lord God says to David in 2 Samuel 7, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is a sin-proof covenant. You can't sin in the way. It's a death-proof covenant. It's an eternal covenant. Now, in the first instance, it's talking about Solomon. Solomon, of course, is the one who will go astray, and God will beat him and reprove him with the rods of men, but he will ultimately restore him. And so there's one of two ways a kingdom can be everlasting. You can have a son who has a son who has a son who has a son, world without end, amen. Or, if you turn to Psalm 2, along comes a very unusual Davidite, Davidic son. And we read about him in Psalm 2. And it's, it's clear from reading Psalm 2, there's no possible way Psalm 2 is fulfilled by David. David had a kingdom, but not a kingdom like this. David had honor and glory, but not honor and glory like this. So David writes this psalm. We get that accreditation from the book of Acts. And let's read with me Psalm 2. And what I said is so helpful is Psalm 2 brings together three threads of the Old Testament. We've seen that the Jews of Jesus' day didn't understand that the coming prophet was the Messiah And some of them are looking for different people. Psalm 2 unites three particular threads of the Old Testament. The thread of the coming Messiah, the coming anointed one, the coming king, and the son or the son of God. In in each of these four strophes or paragraphs or stanzas, the Lord is present and a second party is present. You can see that in verse 2, the Lord and his anointed Then in verse 4, the Lord. Verse 6, I've set my king. So there's the Lord and the king. Verse 7, the Lord and my son. Verse 11, the Lord. And verse 12, the son. And so as we read Psalm 2, we'll, we'll come to understand that the Lord's Messiah is also the Lord's king, is also the Lord's son. I oftentimes refer to Psalm 2 as headwaters, where where different tributaries join and converge into a deeper, stronger river as, as these three threads unite into one being. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Is God concerned or worried? There's a, there's a global conspiracy of all the nations and all the kings of the earth wanting to fight God. Is God, he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So how does the Lord respond to a global conspiracy of every nation on earth wanting to fight him? He establishes his king as if to say that should take care of things. If you keep reading the Bible, that's exactly what will take care of things. Then there's a shift in the narrator now speaking from the, ver- from the perspective of the son. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. That's the language of the Davidic covenant. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. So now we see the the expansion of a kingdom. David was a king and he had honor. He had a kingdom localized to a portion of the Middle East. Here is a kingdom that, that encompasses the nations, the ends of the earth, with such power and authority. It said that he will break the nations with a rod of iron, which leads finally to the counsel to these rebellious kings. 
this ruler, this coming son of David is so great, so powerful that the, the counsel to the kings is basically surrender and do honor to him. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry. You perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so, to summarize what we've seen, there's a coming Messiah. There's a coming seed of the woman from the tribe of Shem, from the seed of Abraham, from the tribe of Judah. And Judah unites that notion of scepter or rule. And then Psalm 2 makes it clear, this will be a worldwide rule. This will be an absolute rule. No Davidic son or king has accomplished this yet. This kingdom is yet to be seen on earth. Now, this aspect of the triumphant Messiah, the ruling Messiah, the victorious Messiah, this, this theme of the Messiah, the Jews of Jesus, they got, they liked it. When, when they asked Jesus, will you now bring in the kingdom? That's what they're looking for. Are you going to do Psalm 2 now, they're saying. When he's on his way to Jerusalem, and, and we read in Luke that they're expecting the kingdom to appear at any time. It's, it's Psalm 2 they're expecting to happen. They, they got on board with that. I mean, we oftentimes like the news that's pleasing to us. So you, you say, God's going to send a deliverer. He's going to exalt Israel. All the nations will do homage to us. We like that. And it's true. That will happen. But if you turn to Psalm 22, as the Bible begins to develop, another theme or thread comes out. And not of the triumphant Messiah, but of the suffering and dying Messiah. And it's clear from reading Luke that the Jews of Jesus' day had no way of synthesizing these things together. That they didn't have a category for a suffering, defeated Messiah. Yet these are the words Jesus quotes from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night I find no rest. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were put, not put to shame. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make, their, they make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I mean, this is exactly what they said to Jesus when he was on the cross. Jump ahead to verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones and divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Let me pause here. Now remember, when Jesus scolded, corrected the two men on the road to Emmaus, it was particularly the Bible's teaching that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise that they didn't comprehend that he scolded them for. They got the Messiah will have a kingdom. The Messiah will rule. The, the nations of the world will come and do homage and give tribute to the Messiah. They, they got that. What they didn't get is the teaching of Psalm 22. The Messiah will also suffer and die and rise. So in your blanks, Psalm 2, we see the Messiah, King, and Son united. Here, we see the Messiah will be forsaken, pierced, but ultimately vindicated. Psalm 2 doesn't end on this dour note. The psalmist is pierced, forsaken by God, mocked at. But pick it up in verse 19, where we left off. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. Oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Do you see how the author of Psalm 22 gets through this? The Lord delivers him in such a way that he can give praise to his brothers. He doesn't go down to the pit and die and stay dead. He is delivered. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred 
the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform. Before those who fear him, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. And now we're getting to, you see, first there's a suffering and a piercing and an abandonment. And then there's a deliverance. And then there's a kingdom. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. So Psalm 2, the triumphant Messiah. Psalm 22, the forsaken, pierced, but ultimately vindicated, saved and delivered Messiah. And there's so much in the Psalms, I can only pick three to look at because our time is short. Turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Jesus quoted this when he was disputing with the uh, Jews in the temple. Psalm 110 is is critical because it adds two further pieces of information about this coming ruler, this coming king, Messiah. The first is that he is David's Lord. That's, of course, the question that Jesus asks the Jews, challenging that they have too low a view of the Messiah. The Lord says to my Lord, and David, Jesus makes the point, if David is speaking then who are the references to Lord and Lord? So we know when you see in your Bible, all caps, that's that's the name of God, Yahweh or Jehovah coming through Germanic and English languages. So Yahweh says to my Lord, David writes, who's David's Lord? The Messiah is divine. The Messiah is greater than David. This goes against the logic of the Semitic people where the, the father is always greater than the son. Here, David's son is greater than David, such that David calls him Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Again, indicating that there is a time before the triumph while the enemies exist. The Messiah does not immediately destroy his enemies, but he waits On God's timetable, the Lord God says to my Lord, wait, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. Then verse four, critical. The author of Hebrews spends, what, a chapter and a half, Dave, on this? At least, maybe two? The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he's referencing there the events of Genesis 14 when Abram um, encounters Melchizedek, king of righteousness, uh, the priest of God most high from the town of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem. And, And Abraham offers offerings to Melchizedek, indicating Melchizedek's greater than Abraham. And this is important because it does two things. It lets us know the Messiah, who will be a king and a son and a prophet, is also going to be a priest. And secondly, it solves the problem of how can a a Judahite king be a priest? Because the priesthood comes in the tribe of Levi. And the author of Hebrews makes the point, that there is a priesthood that precedes and is greater than that of Levi. Because, according to the Jewish logic, Abram's greater than Levi. Abraham gave offerings to Melchizedek, ipso facto. Melchizedek's greater than Abraham, who's greater than Levi. And Melchizedek was a priest first. So the Messiah is that the greater priesthood of Melchizedek. He, he has the threefold offices of king and of prophet The priest, he's the son of God. These are all coming together now in this individual. And even hinted at here, he is so great that David calls him Lord. He's divine. I mean, these are coming together, coming together. Your blanks here, David's Lord and priest of God. Um, Turn now to Isaiah 52. There's so much in Isaiah. 
I mean, I had to skip over oodles of things in Isaiah, but I want to emphasize the suffering aspect because that was in particular um, that which the Jews of Jesus' day just could not wrap their heads around. And so we've read Isaiah 53 a lot recently as we looked at the cross and we focused on Jesus' substitutionary death as a sacrifice for sin. We looked at his taking our iniquity upon us, but I want you to see here the resurrection. I want you to see here that, again, just as in Psalm 22, the abandonment, the piercing is not the end. So this one, this servant of the Lord, ultimately will see the result of his work and be satisfied. Because this was the truth. that They were slow and dull in seeing. This is the fourth and final servant song. It begins in 5213. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Shall shall he sprinkle many nations? Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see. And that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced, linking back to Psalm 22 and linking ahead to Zechariah 12. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And here we get some of the answer. Remember in Psalm 22, the psalmist cries out in in vexation and anguish, why, why have you forsaken me, O Lord? And there's no indication of why. The psalmist does not know. He is confused and confounded. And ultimately, he cries out to God. God hears him and rescues and delivers him. Here we see the why. Why does God pour out such discipline on this servant Because he's bearing the iniquity of us all. You're blank here. The sin-bearing servant. Why will the Messiah suffer? Is it because he has done wrong? No. The Messiah will suffer as a sacrifice and a substitute for us. This is why the servant of the Lord will be crushed by the Lord. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep, before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. We've just seen all this in Luke. Buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord, all caps, to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. And get this, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. This one whom they buried with The rich, this one who is cut off in the land of living, shall see. He continues to exist. It may not spell out the resurrection explicitly, but there's an after for this servant. And after he is cut off from the land of the living, and after he is buried, he is doing things and seeing things and being satisfied. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand out of the anguish of his soul. He shall see and be satisfied. The Lord Jesus will look upon those he has redeemed in the glory of the kingdom, and he will be well satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accountable.
counted, credited, righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many, makes intercession with the transgressors. This is the exact text. The Ethiopian eunuch was confused reading. As we heard from Mitchell a few weeks ago. So here we begin to see why it must be that this servant must suffer, why the Messiah must suffer and die, and yet his death is not the end of him. He continues on. And these are the pieces that the Jews did not synthesize. They loved the conquering Messiah. They loved the triumphant Messiah. And yet, ironically, they thought too low of him. So Jesus has to challenge them there. And as you turn to Daniel 7, you'll see just how exalted the Messiah is. What was Jesus' favorite title for himself? Anyone? Son of man. It's his favorite self-designation. And it's a rather clever, cryptic title. Because there is a precedent in in this Old Testament, in Ezekiel in particular, for the Son of Man to simply mean human, mortal, prophet. And that's what God keeps referring to Ezekiel over and over and over again. Son of man, this, son of man, that. And so when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, it doesn't set off any red flags, doesn't raise the antenna of the Pharisees. Jesus means the Son of Man a little differently than they thought he did. And when they find that out, they freak out. They they tear their clothes, pull out their hair, and condemn him to death. Because Jesus makes it clear when he's being interrogated by the Sanhedrin that he's referring to the Son of Man seen in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, to the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man. He came to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory, a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And in Luke 21, 27, Jesus said, that, that's what I mean my son of man. Matthew 24, 30. That's what I mean by son of man. And when the Pharisees got it, they go, what? And they, that's it. He's condemned to death for blasphemy. Messiah is the son of man. Quickly now, in, in Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Bringing us to the very birthplace of Jesus. Christmas predicted. In the prophets, pick it up in verse 2, Micah 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephraim, Ephrathath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Hundreds and hundreds of years before the Messiah comes. The Messiah will be the seed of the woman. The Messiah will be from the people of the Shem. The Messiah will be the seed of Abraham. He'll be the ruler and the lion from the tribe of Judah. And he will be born in Bethlehem. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. And then the rest of his brothers shall return the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great for the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. This one who is born in Bethlehem will be their peace. And finally... Um, we got to we got to go to Ezekiel. I mean Zechariah twelve. We got to go to Zechariah twelve. We'll, we'll end our brief study here. Another passage predicting the death, the suffering of the Messiah, and yet amazingly um, identifying the Messiah with the Lord God Himself. I want you to notice who's speaking in Zechariah twelve. There's an introduction in verse one. The oracle of the word of the Lord, all caps, Yahweh speaking. This is his pronouncement. This is his prophecy. 
And we read about a time in the future when Jerusalem will be encircled by the nations and enemies. It'll look hopeless for them. It's a day that's coming, verse 3, on that day, verse 4, on that day, verse 6, on that day, verse 8, on that day, verse 9, on that day, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, pierced in Psalm 22, pierced in Isaiah 53, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn on that day. So here, notice the... Notice the, the mingling of terms. It's, it's unclear. Are they looking on me, the Lord God? Or are they looking on him? And the answer is yes. Who have they pierced, me or him? Yes. You see, the Messiah's identity is so mingled with the Lord God that it's not clear even who's speaking. But they look on me, on him whom they've pierced. And so we get here the pierced God. The Messiah is, is so great and so powerful that he's in some sense indistinguishable from God. And we learn ultimately in the New Testament, he is God. All this in the Old Testament, a pierced God and Messiah who is the peace of his people, who will be buried with the rich and yet will prolong his days and see and be satisfied. All this revealed by God in the Old Testament. Um, The Messiah's coming was according to plan, according to prediction. And what we see in the New Testament in the book of Acts is again and again and again and again and again, they are arguing from the Old Testament. I mean, the Apostle Paul quotes the Old Testament intensely. And what they're arguing is that what has happened, what happened in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago with the birth of this child in Bethlehem is in complete fulfillment, prediction, according to the program of God laid out thousands of years before. I'm going to invite our worship team up now as we prepare to sing our closing song. I just get thrilled when I see these predictions. I get thrilled when I see the specificity of the one who is pierced on our behalf. So please join with me in singing. And stand as we sing, Behold Our God.